I have tonight an amazing author that that has written a, an enlightening book, which is just a delightful read. His name is Paul Elder, and the t- title of the book is Eyes of an Angel, Soul Travel, Spirit Guides, Soulmates, and the Reality of Love. It's available at Amazon, also in Kindle. So uh, I highly recommend everybody pick up a copy and kind of uh, educate yourself a little bit. He is a former CTV television news reporter and mayor of a Canadian city. He spent a lifetime studying human nature from a unique perspective, and he is a survivor of three near-death experiences, a drowning at age 12, a car accident at 17, and a heart heart attack at 41. I would say three has to be the the, the uh, three's the, the 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 secret of evolution. I would think, along with the trauma and subsequent beauty of death, came a series of spontaneous spiritual events, events that would rock his world, turning his belief system upside down, leaving him with some profound insights as to the true nature and ultimate purpose of life. Um, it's it's. It's a phenomenal book. It's an awakening book, and it's an amazing story. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you, Bart. Uh, really, um, a pleasure being here with you. Well, you, you know, your your book uh, was was such a treat to to read because there are a few people that have had near death experiences, and not not many that I know of. I'm, and these weren't near death; these were death. I mean, you came back, but um, you actually did die yes. and come back. So, <clears throat> so your perspective is a lot better than those of us whose heart has just stopped because they've dropped something precious. I mean, you really, um, and you describe each of the events beautifully. It's it's an amazing an amazing awakening process, and usually when when things like that happen to somebody, it 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 is an indication that spirit has a purpose for you. And in spite of where you think you're going, it's going to put you in the right direction, no matter what you do. Actually there, um, I I think in in the more recent or the most recent survey, there's over 22 million people in North America who have had uh, what they refer to as a near death experience, a reported near death experience. So it's actually fairly common, but I mean, like if you consider that out of, you know, the masses of people in North America, that's, you know, perhaps uh, a a significant number, but uh, um, equally, um, they claim that as many as 25% of the, that population as well may have had what they call out-of-body experiences or um, experiences of that nature. So um, it's not that um, unique anymore. And I think the, I think the reason that there seems to be more of a reporting of this is that it, it certainly become more mainstream or more understandable as the as the years have gone by. And uh, and I think medical science and and part of it I think is that medicine and science are able to pull people back from the edge a lot more than they used to say 30, 40 years ago, where mm-hmm. the person headed into the into those states of consciousness or or became brain dead, they, that was pretty much it. So now science is able to pull the people back, you know, um, much more than in the past. So that may contribute certainly to the number of reports of folks who actually came back and can describe all of the all of the things that happened to them. Uh, a long time ago, I had the privilege of doing a show on near-death experiences, and I put the call out on Facebook, and I said, going to do a program on on near-death experiences, would anybody care to volunteer to share their experiences with us? And I was overwhelmed with people responding. It was just, you know, I, th- I, th- I thought maybe I'd get one or two. I think I got 30 or 40, and... <laughs> You know, we were able to interview a number of them and put together a very insightful show. I, I think the the out of body experience is something that that just about everybody experiences, but they don't register what it is. Right. And and that that I call it a, a feeling of falling while you're while you're you know in bed and you're safe and suddenly you feel like you're falling and you you reach for this you know you reach for something to st- stabilize yourself because you feel like you're falling and that's really the astral coming back into the physical 
Yes. So <laughs> that, uh, absolutely, that you've, you've identified it. I mean, I've, over the years, I've gotten to uh, participate in a lot of research uh, at the Mineral Institute and at other venues and universities, uh, the International Association for Near Death Studies, uh, for example, and things like that. And there's some interesting things about consciousness that uh, that it, it, when you think about it, you know, um, that little jolt that you talk about. See, every night as we drift off to sleep. Um, we're in sort of in that uh, very delicate balance between awake and asleep. We're not awake yet. We're not asleep. And little dream images start to form in our mind. And then we get those little jolts, right? That yeah. you talked about. And just about everybody has them. And actually what that is, is as we drift away, as we drift into unconsciousness, our energy bodies leave our, our physical bodies. And a lot of times associated with that little jolt is the feeling of coming back in or a sudden movement. And we get this little jolt, right? So, mm -hmm. if you, and, and, and this has become pretty much a, you know, a, a fairly prominent thing. It's a very delicate balance between awake and asleep as we're drifting off. And so it is, in fact, that jolt as we get back into our body. That's what that is. So the next time you folks drift off to sleep and you have that little jolt, um, you know, pay attention to what's happening. You can be aware that, wow, that was me just coming back into my body. Well, you know, so, so, so you had an experience that sort of set you on a trail for wanting to discover um, more about how you could, you could actually control the out-of-body experiences. Want to explain how that happened? <clears throat> well, I, um, I I grew up in the central plains of Canada in in Saskatchewan, uh, about two hours north of the Montana Montana North Dakota borders, and um, we I grew up and we were German Catholic, so um, <laughs> <laughs> right off right off the bat, you know when you you know, I'm yeah. going to say you know, I grew up in a in a large Catholic family, but that's redundant, isn't it? Yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> <clears throat> so my, my mother had um, um, eight girls in a row, and then she figured out what was happening and changed the dial, and she had three boys. And I was the 10th out of 11. And wow. um, we, we were, I mean, we grew up in a farm in the middle of nowhere, so we were very, very poor and not apt to believe in a lot of Wawa stuff. Um, for me, I mean, we were, you know, my little brother and I were forced to sort of, well, I don't know if forced is the correct word, but we were really pushed to be altar boys in our Catholic church in the country. And um, so we weren't necessarily, we weren't uh, sort of, <clears throat> if you would say, um, open to uh, in, to the La La Land concepts and, and weird stuff. When you grow up that way, you know, with virtually nothing, um, you're not apt to believe in any kind of a cockamamie story that comes along. So I wouldn't have believed even, you know, <laughs> a word that I'm about to tell you back in those days, because it just wasn't part of my, you know, belief system, you know, when I was growing up. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was 12 years old, um, and, and as I mentioned, we grew up in the middle of the prairies in Saskatchewan, Canada. And when I was around 12, my a couple of cousins from the big city of Edmonton in Alberta who came to visit in the summertime. And my little brother and I were um, who couldn't swim at all. In fact, in Saskatchewan, there's all sorts of lakes, like thousands of lakes and ponds and stuff all over the place. <clears throat> and we were warned not to ever go near these lakes because we couldn't swim. And so on this particular Saturday afternoon, we were off uh, – I'm not sure what we were doing, chasing gophers or something, out hiking around on the prairies. And we came upon a pond about probably about 15 feet deep. And in this, at the end of the pond was a raft that the neighbor's kids had abandoned or left there or somebody did in this large pond. <clears throat> well, the next thing you know, of course, we're all four of us are, you know, bobbing up and down on this raft. And my older cousin thought it would be, considering the fact that my little brother and I were terrified of water, thought it would be really a lot of fun to rock the raft. Well, and you see, Murphy lives with me. So if you've had no bad luck in your life, that's why. He's over uh -huh. at my house all the time, all right? <laughs> so I fell in the water and it was the strangest thing because I didn't have the presence of mind to even dog paddle. It was just like, 
I'm screwed. Pardon me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm heading into the, you know, and, and it was just like almost instant. You know, I just, you know, I'm before I knew it, I'm underneath the water and I'm floating towards the bottom. And as I got, you know, it was probably about 12, 15 feet deep, I imagine. And as I got to the bottom, I could feel my feet sink into the mud at the bottom. And then I must have pushed or something. And I began to float up again. And I floated up to the to the top. And I could feel the water warm up. And I could, you know, and, and the light became more visible as we got too close to as I got close to the top. <clears throat> and then I just immediately headed towards the bottom again. And you know, an interesting thing happened. Um, you know, we all have, you know, probably experiences. I always thought that drowning would be a horrible way to die. And we've all had the experiences in a swimming pool or in a lake or in the ocean, you know, where you can't get your breath and you just absolutely panic. And then you suck in a big gulp of water and that just turns you into like a panic machine and yeah. uh, just, you know, doing anything, just, you know, just terrified, right? And I thought, you know, like probably everybody else, it was a horrible, horrible way to die. Well, guess what? When all the air goes out and the water comes in, your lungs don't struggle. It was absolutely peaceful. There is absolutely no discomfort. And, wow. and great sort of peacefulness fell over me. And, and that makes sense because we spent the first nine months of our lives in a liquid environment. And for right. me, in my 12-year-old mind, you know, I mean, I didn't think of it in that way, but it would probably be like settling back into the womb. You know, there was just absolutely no discomfort. In fact, part of me thought, why am I not concerned? <laughs> and yeah. so um, eventually, I mean, I just sort of let go and I could feel myself sinking into the mud. I was on my knees in the mud at the bottom. And I just, you know, drifted into unconsciousness and everything turned dark. You know, eventually, you know, lack of oxygen kind of thing. Yeah. And at some point, I woke up, but it was like with a jolt. And I, you know, and I woke up, you know, as if from a dream or something. And I knew that everything had changed, but I'm still in the water. But there was a bubble of energy around me. And I remember so clearly, you know, floating in or uh, in at the bottom with my body, half of you know, my, my knees and stuff in the mud. And I was upright and there was every color in the rainbow inside this bubble. And I so clearly remember running my hands through these colors and thinking, this is so amazing because I didn't know you could feel colors. Oh yeah. The colors vibrated and red felt different than green and green felt different than blue and purple and i was just running my hands through these in front of me just in absolutely you know i'm absolutely amazed that i could feel the vibration of these colors and some of them penetrated right through my body through my chest and i began to think hey wait a minute this is weird you know have i died maybe i died <laughs> or I'm about to die, and I had no. See, I'm, and at a 12 years old, this is you know, I know, strangely enough, I had absolutely no reference to what dying was. I didn't even know anybody who died. And the interesting thing about it was that I had read the book Tom Sawyer a couple of weeks before this event. Yeah. And that suddenly came into my mind. And I remember the part, remember when Tom Sawyer is believed to have been out in the Mississippi and drowned in, in Mississippi or something like that. And he returns home in time for his own memorial service, kind of looking in the back of the church. And I thought about that, that came into my mind. And the next instant, I just flew out of the water. And in an instant, I'm floating over the choir loft in the back of our Catholic church on the second floor, out in this you know large old country church floating over the pews and i'm thinking i was just amazed because i could control where i floated to just by thinking about it and i began to think oh my god tom sawyer didn't fly and i'm flying and i was just so totally totally amazed at this <laughs> And I'm, you know, I'm moving back and forth, and 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 I'm looking down over side over this huge empty church, thinking, well, what on earth? If this was my funeral, where are my mom and dad? Where are my brothers and sisters? They'd probably be here, right? And it was just such a an, an amazing. I'm thinking, where is everybody? And why am I? And I'm floating. Holy smoke! And I floated there, you know, completely cognizant of this, and never felt better in my life. 
uh, it was the most amazing revelation. I could actually fly just by thinking about it. A couple of times I actually floated over the edge and it's down like 16 feet and that was a little scary. And I'm floating there, totally amazed. And all of a sudden it was like somebody kicked me in the stomach. And boom, in an instant, I'm back on the shore of this pond and my brother or my brother, my, um, uh, my cousin, um, has me around the waist and my face is bobbing in the mud and he's pumping the water out of me. Wow. And it was just like such, such a, a rude um, sort of um, uh, return, if you will. And yeah. so I probably, I mean, when the water came out, I mean, I probably vomited for a minute or two, get all the water out. And after that, I was just wide eyed and so were my cousins and my little brother. Um, and because I'd been in, they estimate six or seven minutes I'd been in the water wow. and I had this amazing experience. And it was just so this is sort of the interesting how things happen out in out in the prairies in the middle of nowhere. So we knew that if we ever told anybody, we'd get in a mess of trouble. So we made this pact that we'd never tell another soul. And then we walked really slow on the way home, about a mile and a half so that our clothes would dry out. And um, as we're walking home, I'm talking to my cousin, Brian, who was my same age and my best friend then. And I was telling him about the experience that I had, that I was floating in the church. And and it was like he didn't hear me. And he was, he was like, Tom Sawyer, Jesus, we <laughs> thought you were dead. Yeah. And he was just sort of, you know. And, and anyway, uh, you know, we finally got home and uh, we weren't probably, you know, in the yard. I stayed in outside and uh, we probably weren't home for 10 minutes. And uh, finally I hear this kayaking and cussing in German coming out of the house, you know, and uh, somebody spilled the beans. And I'm not sure <clears throat> to this day who it was. Anyway, the uh, long story, longer story short, I mean, two kids got a good whipping on that day and I was one of them. <laughs> and that'll teach me to die. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And And then again... Not 10 years later, about 10 years later, you had a car accident. Where yeah, when, yeah when, I, when I was 17, and see, see, now I have to explain that, you know, when you're 12 and something weird happens like that, mm -hmm. and you don't really have a perspective on it, you go, well, that was weird, and you go mm -hmm. on with life, you know? Exactly. Make another slingshot, get in trouble, right? And I right. found, I learned that, you know, from even my, just my, my sisters, you know, and that that they weren't ready to hear that and and because i shared this because i thought it was so amazing so i told a couple of my sisters about what happened and and they were like hey mom you want to come over here and check the boys got some water on the brain you know <laughs> or, or something right and and it was just so you know i learned in a hurry that that it wasn't something that i could easily share um you know people didn't buy it or didn't believe it or you know chose not to or Probably, mostly, it just made them very uncomfortable, you know, Probably. because nothing more amazing had ever happened to me at that point, till that point in my life. And while I was ostensibly dead, I was floating, and I had this amazing experience. And I think that makes Catholics, or I shouldn't say that in that <laughs> way, but it, it makes Catholics uncomfortable, <clears throat> because well, that's not yeah. supposed to happen, right? Uh, so, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I... You know, and I didn't pay, as I mentioned, I didn't pay much attention to it. And I didn't realize how much it had changed me until much later in life. Now, in, in when I was 17 years old and got involved in a wild car accident and, uh, and lost a kidney and a hockey career. And I didn't have, well, <laughs> I mean, I was unconscious and I have no idea how long it was. This was like in late November in Saskatchewan, Canada, and uh, probably 15 degrees below zero. And uh, this car that two of my friends and I were in, and, uh, a 1964 Ford, I remember that. And it um, may have gotten a, a, a blowout tire or something like that. Anyway, we skidded down the ditch sideways, and this car, I mean, I only remember the first uh, overturned, but it obviously, you know, overturned many times uh, into the into the ditch at some eighty some miles an hour, and there wasn't much snow. There was a little bit of snow on the ground, maybe a couple of inches, but everything was frozen uh, solid. And the last I remember was the windshield exploding, and it came in like like rain on me. 
on my face and on my shoulders as I went through it. And, and that was my last memory of it. Now, I woke up at some point and um, they estimated, they, this, they, this is the police, that it might have been a couple of hours later or an hour later or something like that. And I woke up or became aware and, and I can't really put my finger on it to this day, but there was someone there holding me, keeping me warm. Mm -hmm. And it was like a luminous being, if you will. And, and I was just drifting in that space of consciousness between awake and asleep and drifting in and out of a, what I thought might have been a bad dream. But at some point, I, I became aware. And immediately, well, I was so cold because I had no shoes on either. The, the car accident, when I went through the windshield, it pulled my shoes off. Probably, and yeah. so I went, um, I, I crawled back into the car because I was cold. And of course, the roof was right down on the seats. And, and I actually even tried to start the car, you know, <laughs> thinking, <laughs> why won't this thing start? And then, Dear God. It, yeah, it dawned on me like, oh, my God, oh, my God. And then my memory came back and I thought, where is Gerald? Where's Mervyn? You know, and I, I you know, I bolted outside looking for them and basically tripped over them. And uh, they were both unconscious and, and lying on the dirt, you know, in this field. And um, it was horrifying. Um, I listened to their, for their heartbeats, and they didn't seem to be breathing. They didn't seem to be alive. And I just, you know, um, I was just terrified. Um, yeah. You know, what do I do? What do I do? And I drifted, well, <laughs> I drifted back to sleep somehow. Or, or lost consciousness again, and some a car, um, you know, and some being somebody woke me up, and there was some urgency to it, and I became aware because I was probably, you know, a couple of hundred feet from the side of edge of this road, uh, at least you know a couple of hundred feet, and I became aware of some headlights coming in the distance, and I didn't know how messed up I was, that I had lost a kidney and had a punctured lung and, you know, broken ribs and my right ear was torn off or part of it was torn off. <clears throat> and I saw this car coming and I tried to walk and I couldn't. So I crawled as fast as I could over this frozen field and got to the side of the road just when the car was, it was approaching. And all I remember is there was just a spray of gravel as this car hit the brakes. And I must have looked I had no idea, but I mean, I do remember the look on the guy's face as he's looking at me, because um, I had a cracked skull and my, my you know, <laughs> there was blood all over the place. And and the car stopped and, and he just yelled and said, oh my God, I'll, I'll go get somebody, you know, and, and away they went. You know, and uh, you know, and I went back into the, into the ditch or into this field and, you know, checked out my, my two buddies and I thought they were dead, you know? And anyway, it, I must've lost consciousness again because it didn't seem that long. And pretty soon I see this headlights coming again. And, but this time there were red lights attached to the headlights, <laughs> flashing red lights. And there was a police car that came along and an ambulance eventually. And, uh, and they hauled us uh, all three off to the hospital in, the, in this rural town. And, um, and, uh, they weren't dead at all. Uh, my cousin Mervyn had um, a fractured skull, and my um, friend uh, Gerald had a um, broken pelvis, and uh, and but unconscious and close to death because it was like 15 below, and we're laying, you know, out in this frozen field. And um, the last I became aware was in the hospital when the doctor is working on my ear, and I thought, well, why is he working on my ear? And but part of my ear had been torn off by the hood ornament or something. And I woke up uh, about two days later or something like that with absolutely no recall of it. Wow. And uh, the nurse, I mean, I woke up in the hospital and looking around like, where the heck am I? And a nurse came by or whatever, or, or you know, I'm not sure that I was hooked up to a monitor or whatever, and told me that I'd been in a car accident. And, and I couldn't believe her. It just didn't make any sense at all 
And uh, but sure enough, I had bandages all over my head. My, you know, my, it was, um, but she showed me because I didn't believe her. And she, you know, those little, um, what are they, the, the serving things that you can scoot over a, a bed in the hospital? And oh, there's yeah. a mirror. If you lift it up, there's a mirror in there. Yeah. Well, she lifted up the mirror to show me, and, and, and I was absolutely shocked. My face looked like I'd been, you know, in five rounds with Muhammad Ali. You know, I was just completely banged up, but uh, and I was really annoyed because this was 1968 or something like that. I can't remember. And I had long beetle haircut, and the top of my head was shaved. I looked, oh, like, a, I looked like a monk, and they used blue thread in my ear and in this big cut over the top of my my scalp. <laughs> and I was like, "What did they do? They cut off my hair." Oh, yeah, be concerned about that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was it was just such a you know, such a strange thing, but I had absolutely no recall of the accident until probably two or three days later, or a week later, and then when it came back, you know, and and I remember it, and you know, and the the police told me what happened, and other people did too, and so it was you know, sort of a shocking event. So, but uh, I didn't realize until many many years later who that being was, that entity or whatever it was, that luminous being who kept me warm and kept me from freezing and actually seemed to wake me up and get my attention to, you know, go and track down this car because uh, had I not, they would not have seen us and it would have simply passed by in the middle of the night. So, yeah, And the, the cold may have also helped um, your friends survive it because of of the fact that it probably slowed everything down for them oh yeah 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 absolutely um, and i mean that's was one of the speculate you know what was speculated as well you know is that um oh i can't think of the name that they call that <laughs> hyperthermia hyperthermia yeah um and that probably was true um probably slowed down their systems enough you know and hypothermia set in and uh, but you know um, everybody survived and uh which was kind of amazing to me yeah, and you know, I think it's it's fascinating that you know, of course, you retrospectively look back and you see these situations, and you see that there is definitely um, a pattern here that 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 you're not not that it, it feels like there was a special purpose that you were here to do something and you needed to have experiences in order to awaken the curiosity to find the things you needed to find. I think that's probably, there's probably a lot of truth to that. Um, I learned, you know, many years later, of course, that, <clears throat> that, that seemed to be, you know, one of the, um, in, in, you know, and I've had near, more, near, I've had two more since then you know, near-death experiences, and, and and it's to the point where, like, you know, enough already, you know? Well, no, I know one is the heart attack. What was the other one? Well, they, I mean, that, the heart attack happened when I was 41. I was um, uh, in politics then, and um, it was actually in the mirror of a city in Saskatchewan, and, um, and I was playing old-timers hockey. You see, and I played hockey, I played, you know, junior hockey um, in Canada, and, um you know, so here is like turn the clock ahead 20, 30 years, and I'm playing old timers hockey. I'm 41 years old, and um, it was early in the season. It was probably in November of some, <clears throat> I think around November 20th or something like that. And um, anyway, long story short, I had a heart attack in the middle of a hockey game. And uh, my wife, I was married and uh, had a couple of kids by then. And my wife was, it was early in the season, and my wife was giving me heck. It was like, you know, you're not 20 anymore. You're 40. Do you want to kill yourself? And the reason she said that was because we had two friends who, you know, at this similar ages, Bernie, I think, was 39, had a heart attack and survived. And another friend, you know, um, had a heart attack and died playing ball hockey, you know, with the kids at school. It was a school teacher. And so my wife was, you know, sort of like, you know, what do you, you know, you, you, you're not getting in shape. You're just going out on the weekends, you know, and we were weekend warriors, you know, sort yeah. of by day we're sitting in the office, you know, and uh, on the weekend we're out, you know, hammering and running, <laughs> running like we're teenagers, you know, yeah. and, and it was, a, and it was sort of a, a, a really sort of a unique thing because I'm out and it was early in the season 
And I had told my wife, I said, oh, don't be silly. I've never been in better shape, you know, because I'd been going to the gym and working out and all of that kind of stuff as well. Right. And uh, so I'm out on, you know, on the ice playing this game. And some at some point, it was like, you know, while I'm on the ice, it was like somebody hit me in the chest with a sledgehammer. It was just sort of like, whoa, I can't yeah. breathe. And so I, I headed to the bench and I'm sitting on the bench and I'm thinking, and then I became nauseous and I felt like, gosh, I might have to throw up. And I was sweating profusely. And I'm thinking, what the heck? I might have got the flu. What's going on? And my, <laughs> and my left elbow started to hurt like blazes. Did you never like, hear the symptoms of a heart attack anywhere? No. <laughs> so oh. I am not in that, not them. And so I'm sitting there rubbing my left elbow going, what the heck? I never hit anybody. Nobody hit. Why is my elbow this sore? Right. And so I thought, you know, geez, I'm going to throw up. I better go into the dressing rooms. You know, maybe I should go home. And so anyway, I headed into the dressing room and I'm sitting there and just got worse and worse and my elbow hurt more and more and I'm nauseous and sweating. And I thought, well, gee, maybe I better go to the hospital. I don't know. I must have come down with some wicked flu or something. <coughs> it never occurred to me. <coughs> so I headed outside of the dressing room. I was thinking of showering. Well, I should shower, you know, <laughs> but I was, so, you know, I was feeling so sick. So I, anyway, I got my, my gear, you know, put my street clothes on and got my hockey bag. And I'm heading up this long, at the bottom of this long stairway out of the bowels of this arena. <coughs> thinking, geez, I don't know if I can make it up there. You know, because it's like two or three stories of stairs. Uh -huh. And um, one of the um, rank attendants came by and uh, <clears throat> and identified that I, you know, wasn't doing too well. And, and you know, of course, everybody, I was the mayor of the city, so everybody knew me. And uh -huh. so he said, you know, sort of like, geez, Mr. May, how do you do? You know, are you okay? You know, and I said, I don't know. I'm not feeling good at all. So anyway, he heads off to call an ambulance. And I just sort of slunk down this wall. I wasn't going to make it up the stairs at all. So I just sort of hung on and I lost consciousness. I sort of drifted into a sleep or something in all the pain. And eventually I, I, I became aware of hearing the um, paramedics um, and this, the wheels of the, of the um, <clears throat> excuse me, of the stretcher as they're you know, running down the hallway in this hockey rink. And they scooped me up and put me on the ambulance. And uh, long story short is I died on the ambulance on the way to the hospital and, uh, and was brought back in emergency. The, it was this, a really, really strange um, event. Um, as I'm laying there, the ambulance attendant, this you know, paramedic young lady, is asking me questions, you know, and I'm answering her. And right in the middle of it, it was like a suddenly everything started to close in. And it was like I'm talking in a barrel. You know, it's almost like I could hear my echo, my voice echo from somewhere else. And I'm thinking, what on earth is going on? And I drifted away. And I just lost consciousness. And everything turned dark. And then I don't know how long it was, but at some point, I, I woke up with a start. And, you know, if you were if you were, had the musical talent like I did in high school, you know, and, and you got to play in a band or in the school band, and if you got to play the triangle, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I woke up to this like loud ping right in the center of my in the center of my head. It, it reminded me of a triangle you know that you're playing yeah this loud ping and, and became totally aware and i'm laying there and all the pain is gone and i'm thinking that's weird where am i and <clears throat> as i'm laying there i began to feel i felt terrific actually but i began to feel like floaty like a leaf in the wind and and it was kind of you know, uh, I can't describe it, like sort of wobbly. And I started to lift up into the air. I wasn't really aware that, you know, it was, it was from my perception, I was floating up into the air. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that I'm out of body or anything else, but it wasn't until I got to the ceiling of the ambulance and looked down that I saw myself laying there 
and this you know um, young um, uh, ambulance attendant she was adjusting the oxygen mask on my face and looking at her wristwatch and i'm sure that she was not aware that i had left <coughs> so as i'm floating at the ceiling <clears throat> and guess what comes to my mind my wife and i thought oh she is going to be so ticked <laughs> my last words to her were sort of geez woman i've never been in better shape you know yeah. and here i am floating to the ceiling or at the ceiling thinking oh my gosh candace is going to be pissed off <laughs> and I thought about my wife, and the next thing I knew, I am floating in the living room of my house, watching my wife and uh, get our two kids ready for church. It was Sunday morning, and I'm thinking, well, maybe I should be, I should have stayed at home and gone to church. <laughs> <laughs> and I found myself saying goodbye to them. I knew it would be tough for a while, but they'd be okay. Yeah. And then something lurched in my body, and the next thing I'm floating is back in the ambulance at the ceiling of the roof of the ambulance, looking down at myself, and I found myself saying goodbye to my body, which was sort of strange. And I knew this was the time. And I slowly, it was something like something was drawing me. I floated up through the ceiling of this ambulance, and I could literally feel the fabric on the inside and the insulation and then the metal as I floated through it. Each layer was so, you know, vivid in my mind, and I floated up above the ambulance, maybe 10 feet or 15 feet or whatever it was, watching it and flo flying along with it as it was screeching off to the hospital with all the lights going and the siren going and stuff like that. And, and then something interesting happened. It became, it was like I'm being drawn somewhere. I knew I was supposed to go be somewhere else. And everything began to um speed up if you will and it became dark or I'm, I'm not sure dark gray is probably more a better description and i just had this sense of traveling very very fast and there was a peak of light in front of me and i wasn't exactly sure where that light was whether it was in my mind or whether it was in front of me and i'm streaking towards this light and all i can say it was the most one of the most joyous experiences i've ever had i was going home and I was so excited to be going home towards this light. And it actually made, it reminded me, if you remember the movie E.T., when uh, E.T. is, um, he's all sick and then he's in this coffin-like thing and then the spaceship comes back and his heart lights up and he's going home, home, home. And yes. that's what I thought about. And I was going home and I wanted more than anything else to go home. And all of a sudden there was an explosion right through my consciousness and just boom. And the next thing I know, I'm in the emergency room at the hospital with needles stuck into me and people, doctors yelling and, you know, directing traffic and everything else. And, and I was back and I didn't want to be, you know, the monitor was, you know, was beeping beside me and, 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 you know, they had injected, you know, um, different drugs into my system and so on and so forth. And a word formed in my mind because the pain was back and everything else. I was so excited. I was going home and all of a sudden, I'm not. And a, a bad word formed in my mind and it started with the letter F <laughs> and it wasn't fire truck. And I was just shocked. Well, I mean, literally shocked, I guess, but I was shocked that I wasn't going home and the pain was back and I'm still alive. And it was just such an interesting thing to be laying there watching the, um, watching the monitor as my heart is fibulating. And, you know, and I went through an hour and a half of stress, basically, um, with the, um, it took that long. And after an hour and a half, they give me an injection of streptokinase or something like that. And it broke this clot in my heart. And um, instantly I had to throw up and I felt better. And I wanted to go home and they said, no, not so fast. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. But it was an interesting, <laughs> a really, you know, um, the, and, and I do, for anybody who's in the medical, you know, service, you know, and, you know, has much appreciated and everything else, but people should, well, I don't know, <laughs> that explosion of electricity yes. shocks you to your soul. Oh, like, I have no it, doubt. 
it deeply hurts, but it saves your life. You know, so it was a it was a funny, interesting thing because about a week later, um, I'm still I was in the hospital I think for seven days, and because of the length of time, it took an hour and a half to um, to break the clot. Um, it had done it basically killed 25 percent of my heart muscle, and um, so about a week later, a couple of days before I got out. I'm telling one of the nurses this experience I had in the ambulance and about flying out and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and she thought she was, she was so amazed at it, you know. So about a minute later or so, the, the cardiac doctor arrives. <clears throat> and uh, the nurse goes over and she's telling him, she says, doctor, did Paul tell you what happened to him in the ambulance and blah, blah, blah. And the doctor, in a, in a whisper, way too loud whisper, you know, said, you know, so now it's a common thing that happens in, you know, in these kinds of experiences. It's, you know, lack of oxygen to the brain and it's wish fulfillment because the body, the brain understands the body's in dire straits. And so it invents some things. Hallucination. Yeah. Right. And I said, bull. Shit. Right. <laughs> and, and also very loudly. And he looked at me like, who are you to tell me? You saved your life. You know, and I said, that's not true. And right then, now get this, this is like 1992 or whenever the heck it was. His beeper went off. You know, this is before cell phones when they had those black beepers, right? Yeah. So his beeper went off and he takes it out of his pocket and he looks at it. And this has never happened before and never happened since. And it just came out of my mouth, and I said, it's Lorraine. you got to pick Jill up at school because her car's in the garage. And I went, oop, where did that go? <laughs> and he looked at me like I'd lost my mind, and then he closed up his beeper, and he headed off. And about a half hour later, he got back, and he comes in, and he says, how could you possibly know that? And I said, lack of oxygen in my brain. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a heart doctor somewhere in Swift Current, Saskatchewan, who has a different perspective, perhaps. We would hope. <laughs> we would hope. So so all of these experiences with consciousness led you on a pathway of discovering more and more and more about consciousness. And, you know, could you control it? Could you could you <clears throat> be more in control of where your consciousness goes. And I, I would think at this point in your 40s, you know, I, I know, I think you did say that it set you on a journey of taking everything out of the library you could take out. Yeah, totally. Well, what yeah. happened is um, after, after this experience, <clears throat> I began to have spontaneous out-of-body experiences. And um, it, they would just happen. You know, I would find myself floating at the ceiling in my bedroom, looking down at myself and, and this woman or my wife in bed with me, right? And uh -huh. and I want, I was just blown away because the first time that I'd ever heard about out-of-body experiences was around 1981. I read or watched an interview with a guy named Robert Monroe, and he had written this book called Journeys Out of the Body, and uh, he had had you know, some out-of-body, what they call out-of-body experiences. And I borrowed the book from the library because I thought, this is interesting. And I read it from cover to cover and took it back. And I thought, but this guy's a nut job, right? <laughs> and I yeah. took it back because I wasn't ready to believe that kind of stuff. And sure. so anyway, um, 11 years later, this happens. I die in the ambulance and I'm having an out-of-body experience. I'm floating at the ceiling. And one of the first things I thought of was, holy crap, Bob Monroe wasn't crazy. Yeah. And... and and it was such a profound experience. And, you know, in the experience itself, I became, I mean, I floated out of my bedroom and I'm standing there in my hallway on the carpet in an energy body of some kind. I can look back and I can see my body now 20 feet away. And I had never thought more clearly than I did right then. And I'm thinking to myself, how on earth is this possible? My brain... My body, the thing I used to think with is over there. <laughs> and I'm here. Yeah. And this voice came out of nowhere. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like, you know, um, it seemed familiar, but it wasn't like my inner voice. And this voice said, you're not your brain. You're not your body. You're conscious living energy. 
And I actually spun around to see who on earth said that. And there was nobody there. <clears throat> but it triggered me in such a way that um, I, it was like the biggest download in history. I'm standing there, you know, in the hallway or floating, I should say, in an out-of-body state, getting a download from the universe. Because you can't, you know, number one, you can't have an out-of-body experience or a near-death experience with, without going through it a million times in your mind. Oh, sure. You know, and you can't have that experience without reflecting on who you are. If you are conscious away from your body and you're able to see yourself and you're still whole and completely thinking more clearly than you ever have before, that causes you to question a few things. Just a few. Yes, like consciousness itself. And who is yeah. God? If there is a God, who am I? You know, how does this happen? You know, so it, it just sort of yanked the blanket off of everything for me. And I, it, it set me on this pathway, you know, that, you know, to discover and find out who we are and, and what on earth is happening. There was another, <clears throat> another event that in my life that I should mention earlier on, about um, a year or two after the drowning when I was 12 years old. Um, we had, my, my little brother and I were, you know, we're altar boys in this Catholic church. And on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon or whatever the heck it was, uh, you know, um, in the churchyard, in this old large Catholic church out in the middle of nowhere in South Saskatchewan or in Saskatchewan. And there, it, during church services on Sunday for two or three weeks in a row, when we were there, we would hear turkeys gobbling. And, and there were a couple of, you know, two or three or four live turkeys on the on this large property. And we'd see them, you know, f uh, rushing along and so on and so forth and making noises and things like that. And so, you know, this is about, you know, a, a few months after that or whatever, but two year, around a year or two years after my drowning experience. And I'm walking home by myself from somewhere in town. I pass the church and I hear turkeys gobbling. And I look up in the trees, and there's a row of trees about 70, 80 feet high, right? And there was a big nest on, in the, at, close to the top of one of these trees. And I thought, that's probably the turkey nest. I didn't know the turkeys couldn't fly, right? <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like WKARP in Cincinnati with less nests. Yeah, in <laughs> I do remember that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't know the turkeys didn't fly. And anyway... I'm thinking, that's probably the turkey nest. And so I crawled all the way up this tree and I got close to the top and um, because I was adventurous. I mean, I will say this, maybe this is one of the problems is that when you have a near-death experience, especially as a child, when I'm 12 years old, maybe it causes you to think that you're indestructible. Could be. And maybe that's why, you know, I mean, because most most kids think they're indestructible, 10 feet tall and, you know, indestructible, right? But I'm climbing up this tree because I really wanted to know. And I, and I get to the top and uh, basically my hands are on the branch that is holding this large nest. It was probably an eagle nest, right? And I'm yeah. standing on a branch below and I can't quite look in because I'm imagining maybe there's some eggs in there. Maybe there's some turkeys in there, little turkeys. And as I'm standing there trying to peek in the top of this nest and pulling myself up towards it, standing now on the tiptoes on the branch below <clears throat> and hoping that some big turkey doesn't reach over and peck me in the face. And I'm pulling myself up and all of a sudden the branch below me where I was standing on broke. And just instantly I went plummeting down that tree and probably 10 feet below that, I hit another branch. And it spun me around, and 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 I and the only thing that saved my life is I hit branches on the way on the way down, and it was sort of temporarily stopped me. And but here's the interesting thing: after the first branch, I suddenly found myself floating in the tree, watching myself, my body hit branches on the way down, and finally land on the ground on my back, and it sort of knocked the air out of me. And I'm floating in the tree, looking down, and I'm thinking, get up. <laughs> Our <Yard> face. <clears throat> and, 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 and was sort of like with a big, big gasp, but like, <gasps> and I'm back, and I'm laying on the ground, and, and everything hurts. No broken bones, but and the wind knocked out of me, looking up into the tree, going, 
wow, that was weird. <laughs> I saw myself fall out of the tree. So <laughs> that I attribute to the, you know, to the near-death experiences at, at 12. And so all of these things led me in sort of inexorably in a certain direction. And I didn't understand until many, many years later <clears throat> when I was in my 40s after I was in politics and, and uh, after the heart attack in the ambulance, I didn't understand how it had changed me. Oh, yeah. I had, when you're 12 years old and weird stuff happens, you go, well, that was weird. And you go on with life, right? As a yeah. So, but it didn't, I didn't realize how much it had changed me. It had changed how I look at things. And in my family, I mean, as I mentioned, there was 11 of us. I'm the 10th out of 11 kids, eight girls in a row. And even my family, my older sisters got used to that and, and that I could see things in my mind. I could find stuff. And so, you know, I mean, they would, hey, well, ask, see if Paul can find it, you know. Yeah. And, and, and of course, you know, sometimes that led them to believe I was the one who took them. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it was. That's how you build your own legend, you know. <laughs> oh, geez, yeah. So, but I could see things in my mind and I could locate them. You know, but I didn't, I just thought that was, you know, it's just me, you know, it's just, I don't know, some unique, weird little thing that I can do. Just can't you know? everybody do it. Right. I, I, you know, I didn't, it, I didn't associate it with anything, you know, um, but it wasn't until many, many years later that I discovered what that was all about and, you know, and, and perhaps why that happened. <clears throat> when, you, when you look at your career, when you look at all of the different things you've done to to take you to where you are today is amazing. It's quite a journey. Well, I've done a lot of things, but it, it proves that I can't hold a job, you know. <laughs> I don't know. You've been <laughs> doing this for a very long time. Yes, yeah. So, um, but it, it really opened me up to, you know, um, it, it changed everything. You know, I mean, right from that very first near-death experience, the drowning, you know, it sort of led me inexorably. And I found out many, many years later that I had agreed to do certain things when I came here and before I came here and that I was procrastinating and didn't want to do it. And so, you know, this was, you know, kind of set up to get my attention or whatever. I, I call them my two by four experiences. Yes. And that was what they, that was precisely what they are. And, and I can, <clears throat> I can tell you now, I mean, and, you know, years ago, I probably wouldn't have. But the most amazing, and I get to, you know, I'm, I'm lucky, I get to speak all over North America. And and I can clearly tell folks that the most amazing, most incredible thing that will ever happen to you is dying. Yes. You know, and, but the reality is you don't ever die. But it's that transition. When you understand as you leave your body and you transit, you have this transition, and you realize that you don't die. There's no such thing as death. That's the amazing thing. And yeah, I and value, and this might sound like you know craziness, <clears throat> but not like anything else I've told you sounds like craziness. Right. <laughs> but it's, uh, to me, it was the, um, the most valuable, I mean, I've done a lot of things in my life. The most valuable experiences that I've had are the several near-death experiences. I'm not talking about and 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 <clears throat> I mean I'm not I'm not talking about the pain of all of this or you know of uh, of a heart attack or whatever I'm talking about that transitional period oh, when yeah. you realize that you exist you know and you last forever or at least that was my perception Absolutely and so many people you know speak to that point and why you can intellectually understand it and grasp it to embrace it is a whole nother ball of wax. And I think only people who have actually experienced it can actually embrace it. You know, it's like, I've read it, I know it, I believe it, but until I'm there and experience it, <clears throat> you know, it's, you still have the, I doubt it. And, uh, we're going to have me we're going to hear music in just a minute and, and we're going to have a three minute break so i don't want to get started on anything but okay <laughs> i think i'm gonna i'm gonna kind of um stall for a few minutes here um i i just really believe that that we all have callings and if 
we aren't really going in the direction of those callings. And the callings are really our own voice from spirit reminding us the direction we were supposed to go. We have tonight with us Paul Elder. He is the um, author of, a, of an amazing book called Eyes of an Angel, Soul Travel, Spirit Guides, Soulmates, and the Reality of Love. It's on Amazon, and you can get it on Kindle as well, and I highly recommend everybody check it out because it talks about things that are fascinating and, and exciting, such as um, out-of-body experiences, astral travel, soulmates, and so much more. <clears throat> so welcome back, Paul. Thank you, Bart. Um, we were talking about consciousness and how you were having uh, spontaneous out-of-body experiences. Um, I think for those who have not experienced them, it's important to say that, that normally these happen just before or just after we're, we're, we're waking up from sleep. You don't get normally a spontaneous out-of-body experience in the middle of the day when you're working someplace. <laughs> to my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's certainly, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's when you're in, in an altered state, when you're in sleep states or dream states, if you will. Um, now, I began to have, and um, you know, sort of to continue that thread, um, I began to have um, numerous out-of-body experiences. And where I, well, most of the time, it, I mean, well, they were always, almost always spontaneous. So this just happened. But yeah. after that first experience, I wanted to make it happen so much. I spent probably three months um, every night, <clears throat> excuse me, laying on my bed, you know, trying to make this happen again. And the reality is it's not something you can make happen. You can open yourself to allowing it to happen. But the harder you try, the more impossible it becomes. Because in order for this to happen, you have to be completely relaxed. And as long as you're trying and trying to make something, your consciousness is way up here when it needs to be way down here, completely relaxed. And so I tried everything that I could think of. I borrowed from the library every book I could find on out-of-body experiences. I borrowed Bob Monroe's book back and discovered that he had written another book um, called Far Journeys. And in the second book that he had written, he talked about this place that he had developed or set up. It was a nonprofit organization called the Monroe Institute in, based out of Charlottesville or near Charlottesville, Virginia. And um, people could go there, the general public, and they were getting people from all over the world who could come there and spend six days with them with this special technology that uh, Bob Monroe had developed. They, in the laboratory in the early days, um, what uh, Bob you know, was blessed to have, he was actually a, uh, a, a really high ranking uh, radio producer back in the radio days. He produced shows, he worked for a company uh, that um, was contracted by NBC. And Bob produced shows like The Shadow, The Green Hornet, uh, oh. that kind of shows. So that was actually his brainchild. Right. And so Bob had a lot of money when, you know, that, because, you know, I mean, back, you know, in, in those days for the rest of the world in 1951, the year that I was born for it, since Bob was a producer with NBC, uh, with the company contracted to NBC. And um, guess what the average salary was back in 1951? It was about um, $3,400 $3, a year. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to, I was, I was going to get there. <laughs> and uh, but and and so I mean it's, anyway he had a lot of money um, that he had made over the years and uh, when he wrote this book it became something of a classic and people from all over the world that's his first book I'm talking about journeys out of the body and uh, people from all over the world sent him letters and stuff in those days or phoned and said, thank you, thank you. I know that happens to me too. I know I'm not insane. Right. Anyway, what and Bob was so um, interested in this. He owned cable television companies when cable TV first came out and things like that. So he was so interested in the consciousness of the whole thing. What makes it happen? In fact, one of Bob's biggest interests was trying to figure out a way where he could make himself do it at will. And right. so 
he brought in, he set up a laboratory and he brought in people, some of these people that had written to him saying, I can do this at will or, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And so he brought them in and hooked them up with the rudimentary computer equipment that they had in those days with the skull cap and the 23 diodes and monitored their brain waves. And basically, Bob would instruct them and say, okay, do your thing, right? Go to that place wherever it is, you know, go to an out-of-body state. And they would monitor the brain waves. And what they discovered is some interesting things. They discovered that these numerous people that they brought in and put them in this little laboratory environment in an isolation chamber, that when they described being in this level of consciousness, that they had very similar brain waves. And so Bob is thinking, well, if we could reproduce those brain waves, say on a tape, you know, magnetic tape or something. Yeah. Could we play that back? Could we cause, play back those brain waves to someone else and cause them to go out of body or to move into altered states of consciousness, right? So they, um, <clears throat> and he had hours and hours and hours of recordings. And uh, a longer story short, they developed through sort of, by accident almost, they came upon something that a German scientist did back in the 40s called binaural beating, an electronic pulsing. That the, you know, and, and, and really it came about, you know, this, uh, and Bob ended up having, being awarded an actual patent. So approvable in the laboratory and universities and other independent um, bodies that checked it out. He actually was awarded a patent for something called hemispheric synchronization or hemisync, in which um, was used through stereo headphones. And what they discovered is that if they played different, lightly, uh, what's the word for it, slightly altered tones or frequencies in the left ear as opposed to the right ear. <clears throat> Perhaps in the left ear, they might play as a, a pure tone that might be uh, 100 cycles per second. And so if you were listening just with your left ear on a stereo headphone, you might hear something like, mm. and they discovered that if they change that frequency slightly, and say 104 cycles, 105 cycles, and played that slightly different tone in the right ear. And if you listen to it individually in the right ear, you might hear something like, mm, just a slightly higher version of it, if you will. Yeah. And they discover that when they played those two slightly dissimilar tones at the same time, the human brain does something amazing. It actually goes, moves in frequency to the difference between the left ear and the right ear actual the brain changes its frequency and Perhaps. so in this particular case the example that i gave you was like 100 cycles in one ear 104 cycles in another ear that's four cycles per second difference the brain moves to four cycles per second difference and that is deep delta sleep so they found they could put people to sleep in a hurry and when they discovered that if they could manipulate the differences in the frequencies into theta range of consciousness, eight cycles per second, 10 cycles per second, so on and so forth, that they could take people into dream states, uh, you know, be completely aware and cognizant while they're having a dream, or move people into or allow them the opportunity to move into a deeply relaxed state of consciousness independent of the body. And they were able to actually prove this in laboratories and, and thus they was awarded um, a, an actual patent for hemispheric synchronization or a technology called hemisync. So Bob and Rowe set up this nonprofit organization um, when they discovered this possibility and opened it up and they did six day programs in, in which people from all over the world would come to you know, this place in Virginia near Charlottesville um, called the Monroe Institute, and they could engage, you know, at you know, 20 people, 24 people at a time, and they could learn something about their own consciousness. They could learn about the possibilities that we are much, much more than our physical body, and you can actually experience that in a very real way. So they developed these programs, and so I heard about this 
<clears throat> after having this near-death experience in the ambulance and the two or three other ones before that. And I wanted, I was so fascinated by it because I, for three months, I had tried to make this happen again. And uh, strangely enough, after three months, one night, I find, you know, it was just like I'm giving up because this doesn't work, you know. And yeah. so I'm laying there after three months. I mean, my kids are, you know, like, Mom, what is Dan doing? It's eight o'clock. Why is he in bed? You know, <laughs> because I'm desperate to make this happen again. Right. <clears throat> and I drifted away, fell asleep. And suddenly I became aware while I'm lifting out of my body. And it freaked me out. And I shook it off, and instantly I was angry at myself. And I'm thinking, like, three months, you idiot, you know. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so it was shortly after that that I found out about the Monroe Institute and uh, headed down to Virginia. And uh, it was such a wonderful experience there, where you could go in a very deeply private and quiet environment and listening to these frequencies that allowed people to move into deeply altered states of consciousness. While you're, what Bob Monroe called it, mind awake, body asleep. So body's deeply relaxed, basically sleeping, while your mind is awake. What if you could do that? What if you could stay completely awake while you're dreaming? You can create a lucid dream, you can make, turn it into an out-of-body experience, all sorts of things, right? So yeah. I discovered, I found about, out about this, went there, and, and I was so fascinated by it. It was such an amazing experience. And they had a number of programs, so I began to go to these programs. And I got to spend some time in the isolation chamber. You know, and uh, some of the things that I experienced while I was there, um, some of the things that I was able to describe got someone's attention. And one day, or, you know, I was, you know, introduced to some amazing people. And um, I met, I was introduced to a guy named Dale Graff. And Dale is, is a wonderful, wonderful person. And, but it turns out he was the Pentagon director of this top secret program called Stargate. And and I was just astonished at all of this. And they, you know, you know, some of these people thought that I might have some abilities in it. Mm -hmm. And so long story short, I spent some, some time training in, uh, to, in this process that they call remote viewing. And then I discovered that this um, mild-mannered guy named Skip with a little beard and the, it would be the voice in the headphones that while I was in the isolation chamber, you know, asking me, well, what's happening? That this mild-mannered guy named Skip Atwater used to be Captain Fred Atwater, and he was the actual manager, the you know, operation manager of this super top secret program called Stargate at the Fort Meade, uh, Maryland um, uh, Army Base. And then I thought, oh, now it makes sense. All right. So I spent, as I mentioned, I spent some time um, studying and learning with various of uh, the original Stargate remote viewers. And, um, and, and now I'm Canadian, so I must you know, make very clear I'd never, ever worked for Stargate or really had anything to do with it in that sense. But over the years, I have um, and it didn't come easy for me. I spent a, a, a lot of time studying because, you know, and learning about it and having to let go because, you know, I'm such a left brain freak. You know, I got to you know, keep my hands on reality all the time. And uh -huh. uh, so eventually, you know, it kind of all sunk in. So um, although I've never, ever, um, you know, I'm Canadian. I never, ever worked for Stargate. Um, I have you know, helped out um, with various, you know, projects looking for missing people and missing kids and, you know, sometimes bad guys. So. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> with, with all of this, um, were you able to get to the point where you really could at will go out of body without, without being in the isolation chambers when you were home? Well, um, <clears throat> 
<laughs> not really, not the way that I wanted it to be. And a lot of people have the notion about out-of-body experiences and, and ordinary people can come to the Monroe Institute, but they want to, I mean, they read the books and they read about the classic vibrational lift out and stuff like that. And they want that. And that's what I had the first one, but that gets in the way. Right. It, yeah. and, and really what Bob Monroe found out and I did as well is that eventually, I mean, that's hard to make happen. You know, you have to be completely relaxed and just let go. The harder you try, the more impossible it becomes. It's when you let go and uh, just let yourself drift that, you know, these things are possible. So what I found is that I could, I've never been, well, I mean, other than a few occasions, you know, where I laid down or I, I suppose there's more than a few, but there were, where I would lay down with the intent, you know, mm -hmm. of hopefully going out of body. And, and, you know, but I, I, I could not say that I can control it at will. I mean, it, it happens and sometimes, and uh, oftentimes in this process called remote viewing, the, depending on the importance of the targeting, what I found is about 30% of the time, so three out of 10 times, I might have what we call a bilocation. And that's kind of like an out-of-body experience in the middle of a remote viewing session. And then you can pretty much take it to the bank because it's sort of like in consciousness, my consciousness shifts and I am somewhere, wherever, you know, the targeting is. And, and then it becomes pretty clear. But the, unfortunately, that only happens about 30% of the time. Well, so what is, what is then the difference between out of body and remote viewing? Oh, well, I mean, they can be one and the same. All right. But mm -hmm. mostly the process of remote viewing is, you see, this is an innate, remote viewing is an innate ability that every human being has. All yeah. right? It's that part of us that is connected to the rest of the universe, to our right hemisphere of our, main, of our brain or mind, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, it's that part of us that, you know, and you've all had that. We've all had this experience. You might be sitting somewhere in the middle of nowhere and you just get the feeling that somebody's watching you. And you turn around and sure enough, there's somebody there. Yeah. Well, what part of you knew that? What part of a mom knows her kid's in trouble 3,000 miles away? It's that part of us, that part of you that connects with the rest of the universe. All right? And, and this is our innate ability. But staying alive in these bodies with the left brain domination, uh, you know, because it makes us, you know, it keeps us alive. Mm -hmm. And that's its intent. So what we do, you know, in, in that sense is we sort of override, you know, so many little um, inclinations or pushes that you were talking about before. What is it that pushes us? What is it that causes somebody, for instance, to, so for 20 years, you've been going to work the same way. And then one Friday, you decide to go around the other way. And then you get to work and you find out that a tanker exploded in that corner and you could have been killed if that you went through that. Well, is that just a coincidence? Or did some part of you know that? Or did some guidance come your way and put that thought into your mind? Yeah. Well, no, to me, that's the spirit saying hey, let's go a different way. Totally. And, and, and the, more, the more attuned you get to the fact that, that it's not your ego whispering, but it's the spirit communicating, it, right. that, that enables you more likely to follow the leads. I mean, I've never had spirit say to me, let's go shopping. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd love to say, hey, spirit told me to go shopping. So that justifies you know, going out and spending money I don't have. But, <laughs> but, 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 you know, I have had those feelings of either do or don't go out today. I've had feelings of, you know, it's time you called so-and-so. Right. I've, had, I've had those kind of subtleties that I have learned to pay attention to. Right. And, and usually it is, it usually is a very subtle thing. It could be just a thought that's put into your mind. It could be, you know, that thought that you're driving past the bookstore that you think, oh, you're going to go in and check out a book. And, you, and in the bookstore, you meet someone who's going to change your life. Oh, yeah. That's Absolutely. the kind of that's the kind of guidance, the spirit guidance that I'm talking about. And, and there is so many examples of this all over the world. Oh, Absolutely. I, I mean, 
I, I could I could give you a couple too. So, th th I mean, it does happen to everyone, but it's paying attention. And I, I think I, I stress with most people, pay attention to the subtleties, to the little things, because those are the big messages. Spirit does not send telegrams. Mm -hmm. We're and, just... You know, we, we would like that, actually. Yeah, yeah it would be nice. To, or, or even as a remote viewer, it would be nice to have, you know, a big red uh, arrow that goes beep, beep, beep. This is psychic information coming in. Well, it doesn't <laughs> really happen that way. <laughs> There's, yeah. There is a uh, sort of a controlled process. That, and this is what remote viewing is really all about. It's a protocol or a process that, you know, when we occupy our left brain, and this is an innate ability of every human being on this planet, if we occupy our left brain with a boring, menial task, it allows us to move into the right hemisphere of our mind, which is connected to the rest of the universe. It's connected to, to your kid 3,000 miles away. It's connected to every notion of who we are in consciousness. It's that part of you. And it's when we occupy our left brain, that allows us to make that transition. There's some good examples of that. I mean, this occurs, I mean, sort of the sweet spot in consciousness is theta range of consciousness, which is like dream states and so on and so forth. Your brain waves run between eight, 10 cycles per second, 12 cycles per second, six cycles per second, all right? And in that sweet spot, or even in alpha states of consciousness, where, you know, I mean, and I should back up just a little bit. I mean, if we talk about, generally speaking, about consciousness itself, science up until the recent last 20 years or so has measured things by four main levels of consciousness. Beta level of consciousness, where your mind or your brain is wide awake, engaged in something, your brain waves run between 16 and 32 cycles per second. All right? Step down one step to alpha state of consciousness would be perhaps daydreaming or just becoming idle. And your brain waves actually drop in half to eight to 16 cycles per second. And then below that, in theta range of consciousness, when we move into dream states and rapid eye movement and so on and so forth, your brain waves drop between four and eight cycles per second. And below that, from four cycles per second down to a half cycle per second is deep restorative sleep. Right? So the sweet spot being that theta range of consciousness. And if you could, with the use of Hemisync, for instance, from the Monroe Institute, it allows us to stay in that state of consciousness, say the theta range of consciousness. And it's, it's sort of similar, and probably the best description that I can use for it, all right, is driving your car. When you are occupying your left brain with a boring menial task, mowing the lawn, driving your car, and everybody has this experience. Two hours can go by and pretty soon you're wherever you wanted to go and you're like, oh my God. Yeah. What happened? Who was driving the car? It just disappeared. You were, your brain, your left brain was occupied with the, the task of driving the car, which allowed your right brain to move into that state of consciousness connected to everything where you were able to solve you know problems where you able were able to finish arguments where you able to you know connect with some amazing things all yeah. right well and that's an experience everybody has you know whether you're mowing the lawn or painting a wall right it just this is where we go and when we occupy the left our left brain it allows us to move into the right hemisphere of our mind well remote viewing basically takes that process, occupying your left brain while you <clears throat> allowing you to move into the right hemisphere of your mind, which is connected to the entire universe. And through this protocol, it's actually remote viewing isn't just, you know, sort of a psychic activity, but it's referred to, you know, as a, pro as a protocol, a process, all right, in which we can delineate, we can uh, every being on this planet has this innate ability, the ability to connect with and describe any person, place, thing, or event in history. All right. Now, how amazing is that? Oh, it's phenomenal. And and so over the years, what has happened, I mean, I have, um, after, you know, um, working at the Monroe Institute and, and I was hired basically or recruited, you know, at the Monroe Institute to teach remote viewing. 
and along with this uh, this gentleman named Skip Atwater, who was the former, or uh, Captain Fred Atwater, who was the former uh, um, Stargate manager. And when Skip retired in 78 or whenever it was, or 86 or something like that, um, Bob Monroe hired him at the Monroe Institute as a research director. And um, so I only learned this afterwards because this was, this was all top secret, right? Yeah. So I found it just, you know, sort of an amazing, amazing process, you know. And it was the process itself, the protocol, developed by Stanford Research Institute in Menlo Park in California, you know, that allows everybody on this planet to be able to, <clears throat> to basically be able to do something that would be considered impossible. Describe any person, place, thing, or event, you know, in history, accurately. Mm -hmm. And so, to me, the whole thing was just so stunning and so exciting and so amazing. As we can do this, this is amazing. And I teach remote viewing, have now for gosh, fifteen years, and I've never run. I've trained over twenty-eight hundred people, and I've, you know, in, including sometimes CIA agents or you know, police officers and so on and so forth in Canada as well. And I've never run into anybody who didn't get it, who couldn't do it. It's our natural innate ability. I mean, well, obviously yeah. some are better at it than others. It's like every other, every other pursuit. I mean, you know, everyone can learn to play the piano, right? With enough mm -hmm. practice, but that doesn't get you to Carnegie Hall, you know, unless you have some special talent. So some are more talented and better at it than others, but everybody can actually do it. Everybody can learn to play the piano. Everybody can learn to remote view, which involves or allows you to move in consciousness to doing, you know, connecting with persons, places, things, anywhere in the universe. Well, now, if that's the case, um, the Stargate project is no longer um, out there. The government said it doesn't work and we got inaccurate evidence. And yet, what you're doing proves that 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 of course it does work. Well, so. <laughs> there's <clears throat> there's an, <clears throat> an interesting thing happened back in 1995 or 1996. I can't remember which year it was, in which you know somehow the word got out there or it got leaked. You know, Chicago Tribune, New York Times had headlines like "You'll never believe what the government's been doing. They've been training psychics as spies." You know, and when the giggle <laughs> factor. You know, the giggle factor sets in, you know, and when you have a top secret program and everybody knows about it, it kind of <laughs> loses its value, right? Yeah. So in, in, <clears throat> in sort of typical fashion, um, CIA then came out as directed, you see, and, and my understanding, you know, I mean, I'm just, you know, from a sideline thing because, you know, I'm not American and I was not involved in the Stargate program. I just gotcha. worked with, with the, the folks that were in it, all right? And from my understanding is there were a couple or three or four um, very powerful, highly placed congressional members who were born again Christian. And this whole notion is not compatible with their belief system. No. All right. And so, you know, and anyway, they, you know, they tried to bag it. And then the, <clears throat> when it got leaked, the CIA came out and said, yeah, we've been doing this for 23 years and we spent lots of money on it, but it really doesn't work that good. So we're canceling it. <laughs> Right. Some yeah. of the things that were that happened during those twenty-three years were so amazing. All right. Some of it is a lot of it has been declassified. A whole bunch of information, a whole bunch of those remote viewing sessions are still classified. Right. And the process itself or the you know the findings that these people did. Now and a lot of people will say, well, did they really cancel Stargate or does that, you know, well, yes, they did. They canceled Stargate and the ladies and gentlemen who worked in it um, were reassigned to other areas or, or, or um, uh, basically retired. All right. But do you think that if something is works so well and is so accurate, are they going to completely, you know, set it aside? Probably not. Well, knowing our government, it's hard to tell. <laughs> well, I mean, the reality is, well, who knows? Maybe that wasn't the only division. Maybe there were other projects. Well, I mean, they had somebody that, that actually they 
they gave him uh, an envelope with a card in it that it was, I think, one billion years ago on Mars. Describe, huh. you know? Yeah, it was actually a million years. A million, okay. A, a million years BC. Right. And the, the difference between what what is on Mars right now as opposed to one million years BC. Yeah, but this person didn't even know what the question was. Totally, just, and and it's all double blind, and there's absolutely the, the fellow's name was Joe McMonagle, and Joe was probably you know the mainstay was probably one of the best remote viewers on this planet, and uh, completely blind, uh, given a coordinate that could be anywhere on a rounded surface, and it just happened to be the surface of Mars, one million years BC. And he got, I think, valid information. Um, very much so. Well, I mean, you know, uh, but but that was just, I mean, some of Joe's actual, you know, um, real work and, and many of the remote viewers, Mel Riley, Hartley Trent, uh, you know, um, Paul Smith, uh, so many others, David Morehouse, um, uh, so many others, Lynn Buchanan, for instance, um, some of the work they did was just so stunningly, amazingly accurate. That there's, you know, and when we're and, and considering that it's double blind, so they didn't have a clue, and they're able to describe what somebody is doing or what somebody is thinking on the other side of the planet, mm -hmm. and do it accurately. That's amazing. But every, as I mentioned, every single person on this planet, this is an innate ability that we all have. Some, as I mentioned, are like are better at it than others. I mean, some of the what you're talking about is sort of you know a, a, a fairly famous uh, example uh, of remote viewing. But in it, in and of itself, the remote viewing of the surface of planet Mars, um, really, you know, I mean, in, until we're there, <laughs> we we can't prove that. Well, no, that's true. And even if we do get there or or have been there and nobody's telling us, um, a million years ago, it's hard to really um, validate it. But, right. but you know, the purpose, of, I mean, I understand that originally they thought it would be great to be able to eavesdrop on our, our um, the people that, that we were in conflict with and stuff like that, right. but, <clears throat> and utilize it as a weapon. But let's take that out of the picture. How does... First of all, doing something like this, I have to I, I have to really make it clear to everybody, this is not something that happens overnight. This is something that takes months, years, probably, even longer, to really get yourself to a place where you are secure within it enough so that you can, you know, you 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 feel you have valid information and and, and that you, you trust it. Right. Um it's not something that happens overnight. You can't just take a weekend course and sit down and suddenly eavesdrop on somebody half a world away. I mean, you know, maybe you can, but you probably won't trust what you get. Well, there's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. And, and, and literally people can do it on a single weekend. They can learn how to do this process. It takes practice. You know, mm -hmm. And and some people are just there are I have met some um, out of the twenty eight hundred people I have met some I've never met a single person that couldn't do it, all right to some degree of proficiency all right um, some were just amazing I mean they were at, you know world class you know and uh, just astonishing in their in their abilities totally double blind kind of targeting and they're doing you know, remarkable stuff. And uh, I find that so fascinating and so encouraging. Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> when we talk about, and people have a reaction to this, you know, and whether it's in America or other countries around the world, when you say something like military intelligence, I mean, like, that's the biggest oxymoron on the planet, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we have this notion of these, you know, spies, government psychic spies, right? Well, and, and whatever that, con, you know, whatever notions that brings up in our mind, you know, and the repulsion to spying or, you know, everything else that's with it. But here's a different perspective. I have, I know and have worked with a number of these gentlemen and ladies. And I can tell you one thing, regardless of what the Joint Chiefs of Staff or the, you know, Defense Department or, you know, the intelligence agencies or departments, regardless of what the generals and the politicians or whoever had in mind, 
the people that are doing it, the guys and gals who are actually doing this work, well, you cannot put your mind into the matrix every single day in this way without eventually running into spirit and oh. notions of propriety and everything else. And I can tell you, because I know so many of these folks, that you couldn't find more spiritual beings on this planet than people like the remote viewers, like Joe McMonagle, Dale Graff, you know, Paul Smith, you know, those kind of people. They understand the larger perspective and are well, intensely spiritual and dedicated people, notwithstanding yeah. the job that they you know, are assigned to. Yeah, and what, what the reality is, they are, they, their spirit is going someplace else to gather information, right. their, their consciousness, their spirit. And in order to get to that spot, I truly believe that they have to leave the ego behind. And in so doing, th there's a sense of, of a spiritual aspect to what they're doing. So that, so that it would seem to me that, that a military um, purpose is totally ignored if what you're doing is, you know, tapping into someone else's spiritual, because you're tapping into their spiritual energy. Well, or, or, or um, basically, you know, remote viewing by, you know, by its definition is, you know, really, you know, sort of delineating, you know, information, bringing up information, right? right. And, you know, and, 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 it, and it can be back in time, it can be into the future, you know, there, there's so many amazing uses and abilities because consciousness is, you know, it's as wide as the parameters of every person on this planet, I think. And so it, it uh, to me, it's just such an exciting, powerful thing when everybody on this planet, I mean, what it tells us, what it shows us is that we're not just these physical bodies. We happen to be here on this little journey, you know, so that we can learn, you know, and that we can experience from, you know, from a physical kind of perspective. But yeah. who we really are is eternal beings connected to the entire universe, to everything. Well, yeah, and that's, that's one of the, the amazing things, as far as I'm concerned, when you get into this kind of material, whether it's out of body experience or whether if it's, you know, remote viewing or whatever aspect of spirituality you want to look at, you're you're coming to the recognition that we are all one and the same and that we are all a part of a singular whole that 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 is love. I, 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 yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think and one of the things that I discovered, you know, having died several times um, is that we, uh, you know, I mean, as I mentioned before, you can't have this kind of experience without reflecting on who you are and reflecting on perhaps who God is or what God is. And I've discovered, you know, in through my experiences and, and my belief, you know, is that there is no, you know, um, this sort of an, a, a cliche thing, like, you know, the, the, and we used to associate it with this, with the new age, right? You know, we are all one. Well, I think the reality is that we are. Yeah. Right? And, and I think at the larger, you know, as a larger level of consciousness, and I believe that we are all, because we come here individually, we get dumbed down so that we can come here where these amazing spiritual beings in, 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 in dumbed down you know, physical bodies, right? But I think that we are all individuated aspects of the creator. I don't think there is a God. I haven't experienced that in hundreds of out-of-body experiences and remote viewing experiences and several near-death experiences. I have not met a being in... A, you know, I don't think that they're outside of us that there is a God who we can pray to on Saturday night to help us win bingo on Sunday. No, I agree with you. <laughs> you know, because I think that in the larger context, we are individuated aspects of the creator. So as a collective consciousness, we are the creator. Well, there's there's a phrase and, out there, and, and I did not originate it, but I, I don't know who did. And, and that's we are who we have been waiting for. Well, I suppose so, yeah. But, you know, the simile that I like to use, or, you know, is that, you know, is the ocean. If, if the consciousness of the creator of God were 
the oceans of the planet. Well, we are the individual drops of water in the ocean, but each of us contains the DNA and the blueprint for the entire ocean. So as a collective consciousness, I think we are the creator. We are God. Oh, absolutely. As a collective consciousness. And we come here repeatedly in this sort of little journey that we have here to learn and to experience on behalf of the creator to move us ahead, uh -huh. if you will, if whatever that means, right? To gain experience on behalf of the creator. Well, yeah, because the, the, the consciousness, the cosmic consciousness, the creator, whatever word you want, is is pure is pure energy and right. it 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 needs to have it in order to do <clears throat> what we're doing there needs to be a physical form to experience the different aspects of life so you you have to you have to put that spark of yourself into a physical avatar in order to experience things and take that information you know and and share it with the whole so 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 the yes i believe absolutely there's a spark of the creator in all of us and and the reason that 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 we have this physicality is in order to to truly experience things like love and like all anger and greed and avarice and joy and elation and and i i really feel that there really is no good and evil or heaven and hell it's all it's it's it it's all one well i i have died a few times and if there was a hell i'd have probably found it <laughs> 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 or it would no. have found me no uh, road map huh <clears throat> so I, I agree entirely i don't i i have not ever encountered that and and um i don't you know other than the hell that we create for ourselves uh -huh. I don't believe that there is such a thing, right? There is no devil. This is a concocted story, you know, made up so that we can give all our money to the church in this lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> I, sh I, you know, I'm, I, I'm being disrespectful of the. No, no, I agree with you totally. Of religion in general, but um, what I found is that I mean that's what it's about. It's about controlling people and and creating money for the coffers. You know, is from from my perspective. I think there is a great deal of good also in that. Mm -hmm. you know, if, if we believe in, you know, in a protocol, if you will, that says, no, you should treat others with love at all times, right? You shouldn't hurt other people, all right? That's got to be good. Well, you look at the foundations of almost all of the, the religions out there, and it's, it's the golden rule. Uh, well, it's said in many different ways, but but it, it's it's still the same thing. Yes, well, and but you know, and and I guess part of my problem with religion is that it's all male-dominated bullshit. Yeah. Pardon my expression. It is male-dominated. Whether it's Catholicism or whether it's you know Muslim faiths or whatever it is, generally speaking, it is created by males for males. And so, I, I mean, I have, you know, I, as I mentioned before, I came from a large family, 11, I'm the 10th out of 11 kids, and they were all, you know, you know, resoundingly Catholic. And in fact, one of my sisters, an older sister, is a Catholic nun. And so when I wrote this book, you know, and I didn't want to write a book, um, you know, because there's, there's lots of good books out there, you know, already, but, you know, I'm the perspective that I guess that I had on it and, you know, the publisher in the U S you know, convinced me of it. Um, but when I wrote this book, I was interested in what my siblings thought. And so obviously I'm going to give them all a copy and, and you know, right. let me know what you think. Right. And my sister who is a nun, a Catholic nun, and she's retired now, of course. Um, and, and, and she, you know, she's, I said, so what do you think? And she said, well, you know, the church has changed. It's a lot more liberal now. <laughs> and I said, oh, really? When are they going to let you be a priest? Yeah. You know, it's male dominated. And it puts women into a, you know, into a subservient role of serving, you know. And, and, and to me, it's just outrageous. Because, you know, I mean, uh, I believe 
you know, and this harkens back to, you know, um, <laughs> when they talk about things like the Holy Grail. Yeah. All right. You know, and, and this is sort of a missing artifact that, you know, is somewhere, you know, it's related, whether it's Catholicism or Christianity or whatever it is, the Holy Grail. And this is a missing religious kind of a whatever it is, right? Well, I happen to think that the missing Holy Grail is the feminine principle. That, that our planet is out of balance with this well. male-dominated bull. And what's missing is this feminine energy, the feminine principle. You don't get a lot of wars created by females. You don't, all of these things. And I think that's where the missing is. And, you know, and the, um, uh, oh gosh, the Da Vinci, the book, The Da Vinci Code. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really, you know, I really, you know, sort of um, agree with that book. And I think it was divinely inspired. And one of the things that I thought that was really inspiring about it, you sort of get that notion that maybe the Holy Grail isn't some artifact. Maybe it is the feminine principle that's missing. And I couldn't agree with that more. We are messed up in our planet. And, and when we get back to that balance of the feminine and the male, aspects then we you know we'll hopefully we'll reach some place in um you know of, of peace and understanding well hopefully the pendulum doesn't swing too far in any particular direction because we don't want a woman dominated you know planet either but uh, I'd, I'd go for that though <laughs> 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 yeah, it, isn't it isn't it though better the male and female essence within each of us coming to balance? I think so, absolutely. I, but, that would be, but it's oh. very clear that you know over millennium that this is what's happened. We've moved moved to a male dominated, completely self serving, you know, um, religious society. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, if you took our if you took everybody here today and put us back four or 500 years, I mean, they would happily go off to battle almost every day. Yeah. So, and, and it's mostly men in the army. So yeah, you're right. But, but, but the, 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 the fact that, that we, we still have the need of weapons of war bothers me greatly. That, that we haven't come to a place in time where there can be another way of, of finding a balance within the planet. To, to have to to have to have weapons of war distresses me greatly. Well, I think I think we are we I think we are living in an amazing time. This is a very exciting time to be alive. Seriously, oh, yeah. what has happened? What we've seen in a very very short period of time with with technology and everything else is changing the world. It's like no longer can you know sort of you know. Um, oppressive dictators keep their people from the rest of the world and no longer you know can people be kept apart you know with the technology that the world has been given okay? oh yeah that's, and that's i think true. what's especially exciting about this these are very cool times to be alive right now is i think we are within years of the landing on the lawn kind of stuff um et huh? is here and um and and I think that that couldn't happen soon enough because I think that will change everything. That would sure pull us all together. Yes, <laughs> I'm pretty darn sure it would. And I, I mean, think I it's have... such a wonderful thing to, you know, to op being open to that. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping for it. I'm pr that's what I'm praying for. <laughs> yeah, but, <clears throat> but, you know, I, I think that if that does happen, I don't not necessarily think it'll be, a, you know, take me to your leader, it will be something telepathically that hits everybody all at the same time. Well, I think there is, um, I think the reality is that they're already here, you know. Oh, sure. So it's just, what it is, is opening our minds. And there's, there is a controlled dissemination of information, is what I, sure. you know. And I'm beginning to believe that it's not on our agenda, it's not on Earth agenda or government's agenda. I think it's the ET agenda. You know, so I think these are really yeah. exciting times. And in fact, I'm one of those who believe that that's where the technology came from that we're having today. 
It oh, just I, exploded in the last 20 years. Oh, you're absolutely right. And and I think the fascinating thing is that that um, it's, it's the things like the cell phones and Velcro and microwaves. And yeah, <laughs> I think that's all reverse technology. Absolutely. Well, I'm so sorry we're out of time, but thank you so much for being here. I'm absolutely delighted to to be to spend some time chatting with you tonight, Barbara.